Okay, so almost 8.05, I think that uh, we're gonna get started. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say good morning to all of our friends in Toronto, in Canada, and uh, from what I can see in the attendee list uh, all over the world, it's a pleasure to be hosting the seminar. And uh, today we have a very exciting talk, um, departs a little bit for from previous topics, as it is not only covering um, topics pertinent to urology, but we're gonna try to talk a little bit about where we see the future um, of medical care going. And uh, I feel uh, very excited and grateful to have two of our colleagues here at Sikids who talk about this as uh, they have devoted their uh, research and academic interest to, to this new exciting technology. We have with us today Mandy Ricard, who's a nurse practitioner in the Division of Urology at the Hospital for Sick Children, um, with many years of experience in pediatric urology, and she's uh, one of the leaders within the nurse practitioner community in research, and, and certainly one of the uh, uh, lead researchers in pediatric urology in North America. With her, Daniel Keith, who's one of our uh, fellows, um, and uh, he's uh, currently uh, completing uh, a master's. Um, that would help him uh, apply many of these technologies to pediatric urology. With that, I'm going to mute my mic and, and we're going to start the uh, talk. A couple of housekeeping, housekeeping uh, points. If anybody wants to ask a question, remember to go to the Q&A box and I'll write them down and, and try to caption some themes and then we'll have some questions at the end, as well as we invite some of the panelists to, to give us their impressions about the talk. Uh, Daniel, Mandy, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Lorenzo, and uh, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, when Mandy and I initially signed up to do this talk, it was just going to be a part of our local rounds here at Sick Kids in Toronto. However, we're thrilled to, uh, to be presenting to people from different corners of Canada, as well as different parts of the world. And we hope that you find uh, some of the stuff that we're doing intriguing and maybe even interested in, in collaborating with us. Our talk today is going to be about artificial intelligence applications in pediatric urology. So we wanted to start out by saying that it's clear the world has changed substantially since the beginning of 2020, as evidenced by the masks that Mandy and I are wearing right now. Uh, we hope that you have all been able to stay healthy and well, uh, especially as you continue to take care of patients in need. Although there have been many negative things that have changed, uh, including Mandy missing out on watching her beloved Jays games in person, one of the benefits has been the amazing amount of educational opportunities that have become so widely available. I think many of us agree that we hope that this is one of the positive impacts that COVID has on the medical world going forward. So I wanted to start out with some objectives for our talk today to outline what we plan to discuss. We will start out with some examples of AI and daily life uh, that we're sure some of you have encountered. And then we'll be able to discuss a couple of existing medical applications in AI in the literature. We will then review some of the background behind different types of AI architectures like CNNs, GANs, and LSTM. And although these acronyms might not mean very much now, hopefully uh, we give you a better sense of them throughout this talk. This will lead into how we're using AI in the pediatric urology field, specifically talking about um, hydronephrosis, as well as concepts uh, that we termed virtual DMSA and acoustic uroflowmetry. Uh, we'll finish our talk with a plug that we're always open for opportunities to collaborate. I think it's important uh, that we start off as well with discussing a few quick disclaimers. So number one, we are both definitely not computer scientists. Uh, and number two, we are not at least yet experts in AI or machine learning. And lastly, we have no financial disclosures. So although we are not experts in AI, both Mandy and I, as well as Dr. Bagley, are currently enrolled in a certificate course in AI and healthcare, uh, which is through the Mishner Institute at uh, University Health Network here in Toronto. So this is a 15 month course that provides certification in fundamentals for AI and healthcare, and has been invaluable for us gaining background in AI, and also helped us prepare some of the content uh, for this talk that we're presenting today. So what exactly is artificial intelligence? Um, this is exactly what I asked myself when I started getting involved in AI-related research a year ago when I started at SickKids. 
So AI are techniques that enable computers to mimic human intelligence, and they do so by allowing us to capture and make sense of larger, previously inconceivable amounts of data. Within the realm of AI is machine learning, which is essentially exactly what the name implies, which is teaching machines such that they can improve on a task with increased experience. A subset of machine learning is deep learning, where algorithms can be created that permit software to perform tasks like recognizing speech as well as image uh, through techniques like neural networks, which we will definitely touch on later on in this talk. There are lots of examples of how each of us have encountered AI in our daily lives. And it's definitely not a new concept. So it's being used by companies every single day. Corporations like Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple are all using computer generated algorithms to synthesize vast amounts of data all the time in order to better understand us as consumers. So some of the ways we have seen artificial intelligence in use in the mainstream media are outlined here. In the bottom right corner, um, we see IBM's Watson computer, which is able to recognize speech and answer complex Jeopardy questions and eventually took down some of the best players to ever play the game. There's also Alexa, Google Home, and I won't say the last one otherwise my phone will chime in. <laughs> constantly listening to us and tracking our everyday discussions and searches. Uh, car companies have used AI to create driverless vehicles. And there's also that uneasy feeling of when you log on to social media and there in the corner is an advertisement for something you had only thought in your head about. And you sit there wondering if that was just coincidence. All of these represent breakthroughs in AI and deep learning. So how is AI being applied in the field of medicine? Artificial intelligence is already being used in many ways in medicine from drug development, health monitoring, diagnostics, and as the basis of personalized medicine. Uh, but we wanted to illustrate a couple of concrete examples that are available in the literature. So a couple of years ago, the team here at SickKids started exploring the potential util utility of artificial intelligence technology in the management of pediatric urology conditions. Specifically, the team wondered if it would be possible to take down, uh, to take our own data and harness the power of widely available online cloud-based technology, for example, Amazon Web Services or Windows Azure. So these are systems that allow us to explore the concept of predictive analytics, which refers to the practice of using data to determine future patterns uh, by using machine learning algorithms and statistical analyses. So this was the outcome of that, um, that idea. Um, it's a prospective hydronephrosis database that was explored um, and published in this predictive analytics paper in 2019. So in this study, a total of 557 patients were assessed. Um, patient variables such as age, uh, sex, circumcision status, laterality, etiology, as well as the APD, SFU grade, and information on reflux status and renal scans were all included with the goal of predicting which patients would ultimately undergo surgery. Let's see if this works. There we go. So data was prepared and placed in the Windows Azure online cloud-based machine learning studio, which is completely free to use. The data was then split 70% to 30% in order to uh, use part of this to train the algorithm and the remainder to test the algorithm. What the algorithm showed is that the machine learning software had an excellent ability to predict which patients would eventually undergo um, surgical uh, intervention. The area under the curve was 0 0.9 and accuracy was 0 0.87. The major benefits of this type of technology were threefold in my opinion. Number one, it was free. Uh, number two, it was easily available. And then the last one, which is probably the most important, was that it was exceptionally fast. Um, so the average runtime to train, score, and evaluate the model was approximately five seconds, which is extremely impressive, especially when you consider the hours it takes to do statistics using traditional software. Another example of AI-based stunned work done at our hospital was this study, um, where data was collected on constant monitoring in babies admitted to the NICU. 
Vast amounts of data were collected from second by second continuous monitoring of parameters like blood pressure, oxygen saturation, and ECG rhythms, as well as individual alert thresholds um, from each of these parameters. And they used this to study if there were any early warning signs of impending decompensation or need for CPR. And so what they found were there were several, er, several early indicators that we might not recognize um, through traditional monitoring of decompensation. And these were noted and are now used um, and basically been implemented in the NICU based on this AI system. Another example is the research paper from Nature, which was published in 2017, which was titled Dermatologist Level Classification of Skin Cancer with Deep Neural Networks. So what this is saying is that they trained AI algorithms to stratify skin lesions from photos. Researchers took approximately 130,000 images from over 2,000 different types of skin lesions. They then created an algorithm that stratified each of these lesions into a novel taxonomic classification. And over time, this algorithm was able to correctly label um, different classifications of the lesions. In fact, it actually did so well that it outperformed 21 blinded board certified dermatologists. So this is now the basis of a medical app that you can download on your phone for looking at skin lesions. These quick examples of AI technology show you the potential of massive data collection and analysis. At SickKids, uh, a key component of the strategic plan heading toward 2025 is to optimize AI technology in order to improve personalized patient care. We are hoping to contribute to this vision through the work that we are doing here at SickKids and that we're gonna present to you today. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Mandy to tell you more. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so now I'll discuss how AI has been implemented into pediatric urology, in particular with my main research focus, which is hydronephrosis. Uh, we'll also discuss a little bit about our most recent initiative with Euroflowmetry. We call this uh, acu acoustic Euroflow. Uh, so hydronephrosis is the most common congenital anomaly detected prenatally, and it occurs in up to 1% to 5% of pregnancies. Uh, because it's so common, it also represents upwards of 15 to 30 percent of our clinic volumes for close postnatal postnatal monitoring. As most of you know, hydronephrosis is not a disease or an illness, but a finding on ultrasound. And the natural history of hydronephrosis varies from self-resolving or transient to obstructive hydronephrosis that might benefit from a surgical intervention. Because the etiology of hydronephrosis is not always clear up front, it is beneficial to consider the goals of hydronephrosis management. We need to select the patients that are most likely to benefit from timely interventions. We want to prevent deterioration of renal function. And in those that we choose to monitor closely, we want to mitigate the risk of symptom development such as UTIs, stones, and pain. It's also important to minimize patient and parent anxiety and we also need to make an effort to reduce the quantity and frequency of imaging studies, particularly those that are invasive or involve radiation, like LASIK scans and BCEGs. So despite having a good understanding of the management goals, deciding between surgical intervention and monitoring remains a, remains a common challenge, and it is a controversial topic within the pediatric urology subspecialty. Thankfully, we have some guidelines that are available and can help us guide our decision making for hydronephrosis. This one is from the 2018 CUA guideline in antenatal hydro. This is a flow diagram that separates hydronephrosis by severity of dilatation. And depending on the clinical trajectory, the patient, depending on the clinical trajectory, the patient will receive at least one future ultrasound. And many will undergo a VC or G or LASIK scan, both of which will require painful procedures to facilitate them like catheters and IVs, as well as, ex as, well as exposure to radiation, plus the additional costs associated with all of this testing. So we put our patients through all of these tests to provide information to help us decide who would benefit from surgery. Indications for surgery from the same guideline are listed here. And while this list is quite comprehensive, and includes our indications for surgery for our population of hydro patients at SickKids, many of these points remain, deba remain debatable and they may contribute to the long-standing surgery as an outcome debate that often comes up at our meetings. So after reviewing these guidelines, flow diagrams, and indications for surgery, I wanted to show you what the current management of hydronephrosis looks like at SickKids. So hydronephrosis is detected prenatally, 
and is followed postnatally with serial ultrasounds. Depending on the appearance of the hydronephrosis or the development of symptoms like infections, patients may undergo invasive tests like VCUG or nuclear scans, and at some point, they may require a surgical, a surgical intervention. From our data at SickKids, less than half of patients investigated with a nuclear scan will ultimately undergo surgery. So is there a better way to identify which patients would benefit from surgery without, investing, without investigating all of them with LASIK scans? So what do we already know about ultrasounds? The limitations of ultrasounds is that they are operator dependent. They don't give us much information on function or drainage. They also don't provide much information on the presence of reflux or the possibility of scars or dysplasia. The advantages of ultrasound is that they're non-invasive, well tolerated, they're widely available, and importantly, they do not incur radiation exposure. Given these advantages, there is value in exploring if we can get more data from these images. So the idea of ultrasounds holding more information than we typically gain from them has been explored before. This paper from the Journal of Urology in 2016 described objectively quantifying hydronephrosis severity. They looked at ultrasound images of 50 patients to determine if specific features could be used to predict renal function and drainage. They calculated variables like angles, parenchymal thickness and curvature, and attempted to use them as predictors of function. They concluded that these variables did very well at predicting obstruction on LASIK scans, and this may allow for more selectivity when we're ordering this test for our patients. We also explored a similar concept of quantifying hydronephrosis on ultrasound in an attempt to gain more information from these images and make the interpretation of them less subjective. We looked at 196 babies with hydronephrosis and about 30% of them ultimately went on for surgery. We used sagittal ultrasound images and delineated the hydro area and the parenchymal area. As you can see in this slide, we have a sagittal view. We then highlighted the parenchymal area, which is in blue, and the hydronephrosis area, which is in yellow, using free software called ImageJ from NIH. We then calculated a ratio of both of these. So the parenchyma to hydronephrosis area ratio was calculated as we demonstrated in this slide after both regions of interest had been identified manually. From this paper, we found that parenchymal to hydronephrosis area ratio had a better predictive performance than APD and SFU for predicting surgery for babies with hydronephrosis. As you can see in these images, this metric allows for a more objective measurement of hydronephrosis and parenchymal characteristics than any subjective interpretation. So while these two studies I just outlined perform really well, they didn't gain traction in routine clinical practice. And this is due to the primary limitation of these studies that in that they rely on manual delineation of regions of interest, which is very time consuming and not busy or not practical for use in busy clinics. So despite the shortcomings of these studies, they are still important papers as they provided the foundation of the idea of maximizing data obtained from ultrasound images. We believe that there is more information embedded in ultrasound images that can't be recognized or appreciated by human interpretation. In other words, there is valuable information in the metadata of renal ultrasounds. So when we look at ultrasound images like this one, we're often limited by our subjective assessment of the appearance of that image. We can describe the parenchymal characteristics, we can assign a hydronephrosis grade, however, Poor reliability has been shown when we do that. Let's compare this to a renal biopsy core. Looking at this on the surface, we can describe the shape and size of the tissue, but when we put it under the microscope and apply new stains and different microscopy techniques, we're able to make a true diagnosis. This is the metadata embedded into the biopsy tissue. So how can we apply the same type of thinking to this kidney ultrasound image? There has to be much more information packed into this image beyond our subjective interpretation that should be able to help us guide management. So our hypothesis is that there's information embedded into ultrasound images that can be used to predict outcomes and that this can be optimized with AI. So we built a convolutional neural network and we use these patient characteristics. So we have a prospective hydronephrosis database at our institution. We included all infants under the age of two at baseline. We also included isolated hydronephrosis as well as mega ureter patients in all SFU grades. 
We excluded patients with urinary tract anomalies, such as posterior urethral valves, and that left 294 patients to be included. We split the patients into 70% for training and 30% for validation, and our task was to predict obstruction, reflex, and function. So what are convolutional neural networks? Well, they're a form of deep learning with many layers of neurons that are modeled on the understanding of the human brain. These models are very effective at image recognition, and each convolutional neural network will contain four major steps, which I'll explain in the upcoming slides. These include convolution, nonlinearity or ReLU activation functions, pooling and subsampling, and classification. So since the concept of CNNs are based on the human brain, they also have something called translational invariance. This means that once they learn what an object is, they'll be able to recognize it anywhere in the image. For example, once a model is trained that this is a dog, or my dog, Harry, it will recognize Harry regardless of the environment, color, or position of Harry in the images, just like a human would. So when using CNNs for image classification, it occurs on a pixel level, where a filter is passed over the image and patterns are identified. In this example, the orange table represents a pixel and the green table is the filter. Filters are used because they're helpful in identifying features such as edges and corners. The filter is passed over the image and a mathematical operation or convolution is carried out between the pixel and the filter to produce a matrix summary as the result. So for our model, it consists of seven layers. And for each layer the image passes through, important features are classified and then passed on to the next layer. Our model is a Siamese model, which is used because we wanted to include two ultrasound views, so the sagittal and the transverse, for predictions with the same filter used for each image. After the image has been passed through all seven layers, and we have our result, it is then flattened in order, to be able, in order for it to be able to be combined with the additional view. So concatenation refers to the process of combining both views into a single report. And then this is repeated for both left and right kidneys. So in this slide, we're demonstrating what happens in the middle layers. As you can see, there are many possible connections between the layers. The arrows represent synapses and the larger circles neurons. The middle layers are hidden because the user sees the input and the output with the remainder of the layers performing the computations. We are also demonstrating the selective activation functions, which identify the important features of the image before it's passed through to the next level. With this method, selective synapses are activated and not all the possible neurons are activated, which speeds up our model and saves on computational energy. So we use 294 patients, each with serial ultrasound images and many, many individual images. 70% were used to train this model and then it was validated on the remaining 30%. So when considering building a model for any given task, there are many available architectures online that could be tried first. These are called out-of-the-box architectures. We built our model as described in the previous slides, and it was then compared to other out-of-the-box architectures, and we found that our custom model performed better. We also compared using single views versus combined views, and we noted that the Siamese views performed better, particularly with reflex and function. Our obstruction model was the first one we developed, and that's why the accuracy is so good with an AUC of 0.93. VUR and reflux are newer models, and in preliminary testing, they're also performing modestly well. And so why does this matter? Hydronephrosis is super common, and it's a source of lots of anxiety for parents. Upfront, they wanna know if their baby will need surgery, lots of testing, or if this is something that will get better on its own. So previously, we reported that less than half of the patients who underwent invasive testing actually go on to surgery. This is where we see our model having the greatest impact on practice. Our model has the potential to impact practice by allowing monitoring by ultrasound alone for those who are, low risk, who are at low risk of needing surgery, as well as expediting surgery for patients most likely to benefit from it while minimizing the need for invasive testing. So while this sounds promising, how do we know that we can believe these predictions? So I'm sure many of you are wondering how our model is able to assess the image and come up with a prediction. This is called the black box phenomena and refers to the uncertainty with what is happening in the hidden layers of a model. 
we see what goes into the model and we see what comes out, but we have no idea how this output is generated. This is why it's helpful to ensure explainability of models by identifying features being used to classify the images. In this example, the task was to predict emphysema from chest x-rays. However, as you can see, the heat map generated highlights characteristics of the model identified as important, which are clearly not the lung fields. So while this model may be accurate, they found that important sources of bias in the images, such as patient demographics in the left-hand corner, are highlighted to fuel the prediction. And this is obviously not something that's diagnostic for emphysema. So how do we know we can trust our model? So our model generates these grad cam overlays on our images. And as we can see from this example, the areas in yellow are those deemed most important for the prediction. And we as clinicians can look at this and understand this prediction because these are the same areas that we would look at when we were assessing hydronephrosis severity, such as the hydronephrosis area, as well as the parenchymal characteristics. So the previous slide shows that with good accuracy, we can confidently predict obstruction. We've had modest success with predicting function from MAG3 results and ultrasound images from our existing hydronephrosis database. As we know, DMSA scans typically provide a more accurate estimate of function, and therefore we hypothesized that better results could be achieved from using DMSA and ultrasounds, and we were able to secure a grant at our institution to further explore this using GANs. So GANs are another form of deep learning architecture, but they work differently than CNNs. The idea behind GANs is the use of a generative set. Generative sets, also known as the generator, attempt to introduce fake data, hence the name adversarial, that are based on the training set or the adversary. The generator then tries to fool the adversary into identifying the new data as real world data. This photo is an example of using GANs to generate an image of what zebras would look like if they were horses, and what horses would look like if they were zebras. So the discriminator learns from the given data. The generator then adds fake generated images that the discriminator classifies as either real world, real world or fake. This process goes on and on, and in each iteration, both the generator and the discriminator continue to add and classify images until they are no longer distinguishable. So we're attempting to use this architecture to develop virtual DMSA scans in an attempt to more accurately determine a prediction of function from ultrasound images by generating fake DMSAs from those ultrasound images. Okay, I'll pass it back to Dan. So thank you, Mandy, for going through a lot of the work that we're, we're doing on hydronephrosis and uh, signs of obstruction and reflux, um, as well as function of kidneys. Um, so we're going to take a quick second to make a small plug uh, to anyone out there who might be interested in participating in this work. Uh, so we would love to work with other sites to help validate um, our model, as well as help with any related projects uh, that you may be working on. So we're happy to share REB protocols, tips for multi-center collaboration, as well as data sharing agreements. So we've been very fortunate to set up data sharing agreements with many hospitals across North America. This is uh, extremely important uh, in AI um, algorithm testing because although our model performs very well for predictors at our own institution, we need to reduce the risk of overfitting and biases by assessing how it functions in other settings. So the next phase is to use ultrasound images and some easily acquired data and run them through our model with predictions being sent back to these institutions that we are collaborating with. Collaboration with other centers will be made even easier with our funded hydronephrosis prediction app. Um, this was developed by experts from SickKids Center for Computational Medicine. So here we outline the schema of the secure web-based application where ultrasound images and limited clinical variables can be uploaded and passed through the algorithm to generate predictions which as I mentioned before, are then sent back to the originating site. In addition, uh, we're really excited that our model will be housed on the GE orchestrator within the PAX imaging system. Uh, so this will allow for all renal ultrasound images from sick kids to be passed through the algorithm with heat maps and predictions included in a distinct report, which will be separate from the radiologist's reading of the ultrasound. 
So this is a possibility for any institution that uses the PAX imaging system. So although much of the research team's focus has been on hydronephrosis, uh, we are also harnessing the power of AI to help with another pediatric urology clinical problem, which is something that we have termed acoustic uroflowmetry. So uroflow machines are commonplace in many urologic, uh, urology clinics. Um, in pediatric patients, there are definite challenges to the interpretation of uroflow results. Uh, first of all, the environment may be artificial or intimidating for the child, which can lead to a flow curve that is not uh, necessarily representative of a usual void. And that can also make it challenging uh, to make clinical decisions based on this single Euroflow piece of data. So one way we are looking to adapt this is by taking sound recordings of multiple different volunteer patients, as well as pouring of water into the Euroflow machine and recording that sound as well. So we can then use a form of artificial intelligence, which is known as LSTM or long short-term memory in combination with CNNs to map the recordings of a Euroflow pattern. The hope is that we can allow patients to record audio of voids in their own home environment using any type of toilet and be able to forward this information to their clinician uh, to help with interpretation and management. So as mentioned, we used an AI architecture known as LSTM or long short-term memory um, to complete this work. Um, this is a variation of a different type of architecture known as recurrent neural networks or RNNs. This type of configuration is excellent for pattern recognition, especially things like speech and audio. Uh, LSTM helps mitigate a major drawback of standard RNNs uh, where there is important information lost when the algorithm is exposed to more and more new information. This is a concept known as vanishing gradients. So LSTM ensures all of the important patterns from the beginning are then passed through to the final prediction. And so far we are in the preliminary phases of this work, but we've had some excellent results thus far. So here we have three different Euroflow curves, um, curve examples where the orange outlines the Euroflow machine's output, and in blue we have the predicted Euroflow based on the sound recording of the same void. We can see that for a water test, as well as a male and female volunteer, uh, there's excellent symmetry between the graphs. So what do we see this uh, impacting in our clinical care? So we see this type of work as beneficial in several ways including uh, potentially providing more accurate, accurate results, uh, reducing unnecessary physical clinic, clinic visits, which is especially important, um, for example, during pandemic times, and providing access to medical technology to anyone in any part of the world who has access to a smartphone. So we are also interested and excited to learn that other groups are working on similar types of technology in pediatric urology. So this is a study out of Texas Children's Hospital and was recently presented at the virtual SPU. It also involved harnessing the power of AI to take sound recordings of patients' voids and matching them to respective Euroflow curves. So as you can see here, they also had excellent visual correlation between the generated curves. Furthermore, the group from CHOP in Philadelphia is also working on AI and deep learning algorithms in, uh, in patients with anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract. So this paper published very recently described a model that can accurately discriminate um, between mild hydronephrosis and findings in keeping with posterior urethral valves. And they did so with heat map overlays similar to the ones we saw in our model. We are excited to note that we have partnered together with this research group uh, with the goal of validating each of our own models as well as working on additional related projects in the future. So all of the AI-related research presented here highlights the growing interest in using this type of technology to find innovative ways to help diagnose and manage pediatric urology conditions. So as we start to conclude our talk, we wanted to highlight a few themes that we discussed today. Uh, AI and deep learning are essential for collecting and analyzing uh, the vast amounts of data accumulated in the healthcare field. AI applications have been employed and are feasible in many domains of healthcare. Applications of AI in healthcare, in healthcare will facilitate the growing desire for patient-centered and personalized precision medicine. 
Lastly, common pediatric urology conditions can benefit from artificial intelligence and machine learning technology. Hi again. Uh, so this work has been in progress for more than three years since I came back to SickKids and our results to date have been promising. So we'd like to thank our co-investigators, Armando Lorenzo from our division, our data scientists, Lauren and Marta, who have made all of this possible, as well as Lauren's supervisor, the SickKids AI chair, Dr. Anna Goldenberg. So we hope that we've demonstrated that more data can only help improve the technologies that we're trying to create and reduce potential biases in the algorithm. As such, it is really important for us to collaborate with others locally, nationally, and internationally uh, to help this dream become a reality. So as we conclude our talk, we wanted to provide our contact information in case there are any of you out there that are interested in what we were doing and maybe considering participating. We'd be happy to discuss any time and we would also be happy to take any of your questions. Thank you for your attention. Um, Mandy, Daniel, that was a, a very comprehensive and thoughtful talk and I wanna thank you for summarizing nicely the current state of our research and, and um, also explaining in an easy to understand way uh, some of this technology, which as you alluded to, escapes a little bit, particularly people who are not computer science uh, specialists. Uh, with that, I, I see on the attendee list that uh, list that that Lauren um, is on the is on the um, uh, on the Zoom call, I guess, on the connection here. And I don't know if she can open her mic and maybe talk for a few minutes about her perspective as a computer scientist. Uh, are you able to connect, Lauren? Steve, can you can you allow Lauren to connect, please? Okay, may not be working. Um, uh, the other thing that I was hoping that we could do, I, I see that Dr. Bagley is is also a participant, and if uh, there is, I don't know if you can also. Uh, um, connect and, and talk, but uh, I, I would love to maybe highlight that there are other aspects of machine learning that, that we are exploring and Dr. Bagley's uh, championing the part uh, that has to do with the management of genital inner conditions, particularly hypospadias and genital surgery. Uh, he's also uh, uh, studying this technology and I was hoping that Darius could give us his impression from that angle. Darius, are you able to connect? Oh, we'd love to, but don't have a mic on. Okay. So I think Steve needs to unmute um, Marty Coyle, Darius Bagley, and Lauren Erdman, please. Steve, are you able to help us with that, please? It's kind of a private message. <laughs> I don't know. That, um, so uh, while we try to get uh, Darius to and, and Lauren to maybe connect, uh, Darius indicated that maybe Mandy and Dan can talk a little bit about data governance and why this is important. Dan, why is data governance important? We just covered this in our lecture. <laughs> So a lot of this is um, uh, the data government stuff became a very important theme in our course that we took. Um, so a lot of the stuff is about where the data comes from, 
owns the data? How do we uh, maintain anonymity of the data? Um, so the stuff that we presented today, um, for example, the ultrasound images, uh, the, all of the demographics were removed from the patient uh, images and all was under research ethics board approval. So at SickKids, we also have uh, a growing interest in AI and uh, with REB approvals becoming uh, more um, uh, streamlined for AI processes as well. Um, they have experts um, in REB to, to go over this new types of, these new types of technologies. Um, so a lot of this information is um, all an anonymized um, and are just JPEG images of ultrasound images uploaded to um, our model. Um, other things with data governance is, you know, how do we uh, interact with other institutions? Um, and when we have an algorithm and images come from elsewhere, um, so data sharing agreements were also created with all of these places um, with the help of legal teams, um, which I know Mandy and Lauren worked really hard at. That's great, Dan. Thank you. I, I still feel that we're having trouble having other uh, attendees uh, connect and, and talk. But maybe, uh, I, hopefully this is not too much of a stretch, but maybe guys, if you could, while, while there is, uh, is able to join us through with his mic, could you talk a little bit perhaps? Oh, I think Darius can talk now. Darius, can you connect? Yeah. Can you hear me? Awesome. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Great. So a uh, wonderful talk, uh, Dan and Mandy. Um, uh, one question I just typed uh, just for the benefit of, of other people on there who might uh, wish to collaborate through the uh, mobile app tool you've created. How do, I presume that was for hydronephrosis, how do images from outside institutions actually get into us centrally through that um, app process? Um, so hopefully Lauren will be able to talk because she can explain the, the, tech, the technology behind this. But basically um, the other sites will do um, just uh, screenshots of the ultrasound images without any patient uh, demographics and then upload them into the app or they can download the, um, the whole DICOM file and batch upload it. Um, obviously, it's like behind the sick kids firewall and it's very secure, but um, the web application can be accessed from any desktop. Um, Lauren, maybe you can explain a bit more. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lauren, so, you should be able to. Okay. Yeah, I can. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lauren. Um, so uh, what happens is uh, on the app, uh, the users, as Mandy said, they um, put in a de-identified image in there and then they can push it to a central repository where uh, then we have an end-to-end -end encryption uh, to transport the image uh, through SFTP, so secure file transfer protocol um, into SickKids. So uh, it goes from secure environment to a secure environment um, in largely a very similar way you would send data um, like in a bulk transfer from another institution securely. Uh, this is just doing it uh, piecewise, but still secure. Um, awesome. I hope that I there's hope that a, uh, so Lauren, maybe we still have a, a few minutes. Maybe I'll, I'll take a Lauren from, from your computer and science background. Um, could you give us a little bit of the perspective that this clinical work maybe adds to, to your areas of interest and how maybe it merges together the medicine and computer science, how kind of, kind of brings it together and what do you see the future? Absolutely. Yeah. So I would say from the computer science perspective, um, we've been working with a lot of um, data sets that have been um, used to death to really develop these methods. So MNIST, which is a, a data set of handwritten digits, um, you know, just various other data sets that when you move over into a medical field uh, with the methods that were developed in these very non-medical data sets or like at natural images, the ImageNet data set, um, then we find totally new issues. So I would say, even though um, AI and machine learning has started to be integrated a lot into commercial products um, like speech recognition or even image recognition on Google or um, Amazon or anything like that, um, in the medical field, it's still in its nascency because we haven't seen a lot of uh, the data sets and a lot of the applications that um, I think will ultimately be impacted by AI. So 
I think there's a lot of opportunity to find um, where things go right, where things go wrong, and even develop new methods in this field um, as we're gathering more data, putting it in a place that can be analyzed, um, and uh, looking at new problems uh, from different perspectives. Because I think a lot of people were fearful that we're really replacing a clinician or replacing a radiologist. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's more what uh, Mandy and uh, Dan described, where we're kind of augmenting how care is delivered and hopefully doing it in a way that's more efficient for both patients and clinicians and a system in general. Lauren, thank you so much. That that, that truly is, um, I, I mean, a, a, the, I think the way we all feel that this is exciting, no, not so much in a threatening way, but I, I think that deep down the road, this is definitely going to translate into better patient care. Uh, and augment rather than replace what what we can do as clinicians and co and computer scientists. Um, there's a, I don't know if you can if you can talk still your mic you can unmute your mic yes, and no, I, I maybe can. could I, could I bother you with maybe I I I know this is perhaps a, a completely different talk but maybe give us a bit a little splash into the work that you're doing with hypospadias and general surgery and and how do you see that this technology being applied to that and maybe a couple of minutes of the important hurdles that you encounter because of the nature of that work when it comes to the type of images that you will be evaluating. Right. Thanks, Armando. Um, I, I can't see where all of our guests are, are listening in from, but for many of you whom I'm sure are familiar with hypospadias, you'll know that one of the big controversies in the field is how do we describe, and the other word is phenotype, how do we describe what hypospadias it is that we're dealing with? Uh, we use very coarse terms like proximal and distal, and we have all of these various scoring systems that are out there that are all highly operator dependent uh, and have a lot of variability in interpretations. So the idea was similar to what Dan and Mandy have been talking about with image analysis, which is the real power at the moment of AI in medicine is, is with images, is can images of hypospadias be used to teach an algorithm how to give us more confident, objective phenotyping of what hypospadias is that one is dealing with before we even start managing the patient. And the idea there is to reference that to normal circumcision because leaving foreskin preservation techniques out of the picture for the moment, the goal of hypospadias reconstruction is to get as close to a normal circumcised penis as you can. So if we can teach an algorithm to recognize in a multicultural way what a normal circumcision looks like, can we then get, you, you, again, using thousands of hypospadias images, um, to, uh, have, have an algorithm essentially classify uh, or, or grade, if you will, uh, what kind of hypospadias you're dealing with preoperatively, as well as provide an objective non-biased, non-surgeon biased, non -biased um, um, opinion or, or um, uh, outcome, if you will, of what the hypospadias procedure looks like afterwards, post-operatively. How close is it to the normal circumcision that we all aspire to? So this requires, uh, again, as, you're, as you've learned from hydronephrosis, this requires thousands and thousands of images. And one is gonna have access to ultrasound images of that magnitude much more easily in institutions that treat children than, would, than one would have of genital images that are also required for this approach. So the idea of, of, of collaboration and developing a secure way uh, through uh, navigating through ethics and legal considerations and cultural considerations for that matter of obtaining genital images to train an algorithm to do a, a similar type of classifying function you can understand is uh, of, a, of a much greater challenge. And this is one of the things that we're working through and why I asked uh, Dan and Mandy to, to say a few words about why data governance is so important. So I think that hopefully without any slides or, or showing you, uh, gives you a flavor of what we're trying to do um, with hypospadias and AI. That, that that is great. There is, a, I think that uh, Marty is also able to to talk. I don't know if you can. Can you unmute your mic, Mike, Marty? I think I'm unmuted. Uh, it's uh -huh. yes. Can you hear me? So, 
Yeah, so so I, I just uh, wanted to to highlight the fact that a lot of this work um, certainly started and was was supported w when when uh, when you were leading the division as the head of the division, and and some of it is something that you so had the vision to see as important. And maybe as as far as concluding remarks, if you can give us a little bit of your view of this technology, and and how you you know, perceived it to be important and be one of the things that we should focus on. So first of all, I want to congratulate you, Armando, for uh, giving us the Panamanian look with the fan behind you. I thought you might have been running back to Panama. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, realistically, I, I think, you know, I, I've been a, a big proponent on questioning the way we do business. And to me, anytime a new technology or innovation comes around, there's a reluctance to accept things. And I've been critical and supportive, for instance, of guidelines. I think guidelines are there to help us, just as Lauren said, that, that this is not to replace the physician. And guidelines are not there to replace the physician either. Um, and when I, when I started getting interested in AI and when Armando um, uh, uh, asked me about supporting the, these projects, my feelings were, is this is the next step. It's going to be something that, that will allow us to augment our armamentarium, and we have to be innovative, creative, and learn, and get people to accept it. And the only way to do it is to provide data and, and to test your hypothesis, which is what Dan and Mandy and uh, uh, Darius, under Armando's leadership, have been able to do. So I just want to commend you, Armando, for um, for approaching me, and uh, two for taking the ball and running with it, which is to me what it's all about. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, um, I, we're 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 on time. I uh, would like to maybe just take a couple of minutes to to give uh, a, a couple of reminders. The first is that we're going to have a survey that that if the participants could fill out. It helps us a little bit determine if this platform is working and if it if it helps with the educational purposes and collaboration for that matter and uh, of, uh, from our friends in Canada and all over the world. Similarly, uh, to give us ideas of, for future topics that we could cover, not only to review uh, management or diagnosis, et cetera, but also things like this that have to do with research and, and innovation and things of that sort. The second thing is that this this is being recorded and we'll make it available for for those that were not able to attend or are parts of the world that right now is two in the morning and it's not just feasible to wake up to to watch a talks in in, in Canada. Um, lastly, uh, I want to congratulate all the members of the Division of Urology who have put a lot of effort into talks like this and and today. Uh, that recognition goes to to Mandy and Dan, who have done an, an outstanding job and, and a presentation that certainly on a personal level I will go back to when I want to plan talks of this sort, because it, it certainly opens our eyes to, to this technology and explains in a very nice way how this technology can help, not only for antenatal hydronephrosis, but, but many other medical conditions. Um, in some places, parts of the world, this pandemic is getting a little bit better. In some places, it's not. So I want to wish everybody to uh, be that, that they're well, that their families are well, and that you all stay safe and healthy. And uh, from Toronto, Canada, uh, I want to say tell everybody good morning or good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.